so I think we'll maybe just get um, started then. So my name's uh, Jamie Kerr. I'm a partner in the immigration team here at Burness Paul, and I'm joined by my colleague Vincent Chong, um, who will be taking the second um, half of the, the session today. Um, the session has been recorded, and I think a recording will be sent round after the um, call today. In terms of questions, we're happy to try and take them as we go. Um, I think it, it we'll have time at the end, so it might be that we just wait. If you put your questions in the chat box as we go, um, we can deal with questions at the um, at the end of the session. And today we're going to be talking about right to work checks, the importance of them, um, how they're looking at the moment, given all the changes, and uh, why we need to to do them and what the changes actually um, look like. We're conscious from those who've contacted us and from, from those we see on the on the list of attendees that there are some of you who will be very experienced at this and might only be interested in the, the changes, but we also know that there are people who are fairly new to right to work um, changes. So the, the easiest thing I suspect all around is for us to just kind of start at the beginning and um, go through the basics of right to work checks um, and then talk about the changes at the end. <clears throat> the reason I think it's probably easiest to do that this time around is because there have been so many changes over the course of the last uh, 12 months or so to right to work um, checks and the um, importance of getting them right cannot be overestimated and in, in, in the work that we do in terms of visas and immigration uh, right to work checks is one of our most common queries and what we tend to find is that even clients with big HR teams, um, brilliant systems, great processes, um, those kind of clients are not always getting right to work checks done properly. And that's probably surprising to many, but what we would tend to find on right to work checks is that most of our clients, most of the people we come across are broadly in the right place of knowing what they ought to be doing and do maybe about 80 to 90% of it correct. Um, but the but the systems are not always foolproof. And, and it's that final 10% or so that, that can really cause quite severe um, problems. So in the session then, we're going to speak about um, why we do right to work checks, what you're meant to do, and then we're going to go through the rules um, that have changed post Brexit on online checks, um, and um, we're then going to touch on the, the the new technology, the kind of outsourcing of right to work checks, and how that works, and 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 how that's been um, working since the rules came in at the start of the the month. Um, so, right to work checks. Um, should be carried out on all new employees and, and should have been carried out in anyone who started working for you after 2008. And a, a real misconception about right to work checks is that they only apply to foreigners or migrants or people that might be perceived to be um, foreign or, or migrant workers. But the reality is that they have to be carried out on every employee because we can't make assumptions on someone's nationality by the way they look, the way they talk, um, or by looking at their, their their CV. And therefore, right to work checks do need to be carried out on British employees as well, because we need to know that they're actually um, British. And often when we deal with clients and we start speaking about right to work checks, they'll say, we don't need to worry, almost all of our employees are British. And the answer is always, well, how do you know that if you're not doing any? checks on their uh, nationality. So, so this issue about not making assumptions cannot be overestimated. And whilst we say this on every seminar, some of you will have heard the seminar um, where we speak about this. Some of you will have been in our seminars where we, we do little case studies. Um, whilst we know that we shouldn't make assumptions, we all do. Um, and, and it's very easily done. Um, in terms of right to work checks, you can put on job adverts. This is another question that we're asked a lot. Can we say that um, they have to have the right to work in the UK? Um, 
yes, you can. You can see that the, the, the role is subject to the candidate having a valid right to work in the UK. Um, but you should just be very cautious about the, the wording on that to make sure it's not discriminatory. And the other thing that you should be cautious about is um, making sure that by putting wording like that onto job adverts, you're not um, you're not putting off talent or uh, skill sets that would otherwise be applying to you. And you should bear in mind that the sponsorship system, where uh, an employer can sponsor a migrant for a visa, is pretty open at the moment. It's fairly relaxed compared to what it was pre-Brexit. The um, skill levels come down. There's been some, some significant changes which make it easier for employers to sponsor staff. So some of those applying to you might not already have the right to work in the UK, um, but there would be people that you as a business would benefit from sponsoring as, as a visa sponsor. Um, and, and put in restrictive work, wording on right to work checks and adverts um, can uh, put those people off and simply lose you access to that talent. Um, when you actually do the right to work check is a, is a, is a common question. Um, one that you'll probably receive different answers to depending on which solicitor you ask for advice on. Um, it seems to be fairly common that people bring along their uh, right to work documentation to an interview. Um, I'm not particularly keen on that because the interview can be derailed uh, quite quickly by the person bringing a passport and then trying to explain that they need visa sponsorship or that the visa is about to expire, et cetera, et cetera. At which point um, the panel gets into a 10 minute discussion on visas and whether they can offer a job to the candidate before the interview's even started. And then you just open yourself up to a discrimination claim if the candidate doesn't ultimately get the job. And, and there is case law to say that the right to work checks should come at the very end of the, the process where you find a successful candidate, you offer them the job, and then you have the discussion on whether they have the right to work or not. Most employers um, think that um, to be a bit um, nonsensical to the extent that you're potentially wasting time with a candidate who you won't sponsor or can't sponsor. Um, but it's essentially the way the courts say that it, it should be done. Um, so you have to really be careful about your processes and where you do right to work checks because you could be opening yourself up unnecessarily to, to claims. Um, discrimination, there's codes on avoiding discrimination. Usually this slide is just a formality that you shouldn't discriminate against people when it comes to immigration and visas. You probably have to think about it a bit more. Um, and we we do have people saying to us, but well, we don't shortlist those candidates. We just don't give them interviews, et cetera, et cetera. And in, in the current climate where the labour market is so tight, where skill sets or even unskilled labour is so sought after, we do see many businesses um, simply overlooking talent or people that they could otherwise be hiring by making assumptions um, around what we think their nationality might be or second guessing what their, their visa status um, could be. And there's quite a lot of complexity to different visa um, statuses. So you could have an American who on the face of their CV looks like they are American and have just arrived from the US or might not have arrived yet. And, and we might take the view that we don't have a sponsor license, we're not going to sponsor them, or it's too much hassle to sponsor them. Um, and therefore, we're not going to give them the, the job or we're not going to offer it to them, whereas they could have a British partner. So again, um, making calls on one's right to work before you've done the check um, can be um, can be shooting yourself in the foot, essentially. So in terms of the checks, this kind of rubbishy looking diagram here is official uh, government one, where um, the basis of, of the checks, despite all the changes, can still be summarised in these three steps where you need to obtain the documents and generally, subject to everything else we're going to say in the next half hour or so, uh, you have to obtain the original of the document, then you need to check it, and then you need to uh, 
copy of the document. And we see people failing at every one of those hurdles. So when you see obtain, check and copy, it sounds like it cannot be any simpler. Um, if it were so simple, Vincent and I would probably be, I don't know, selling houses or something and, and not advising on right to work checks all day. Um, obtaining the document has become so much more complex after the changes because how we obtain the documents has changed pretty significantly. Um, previously, it was quite simple that you just had to obtain the original document in your hands no matter what. And, and now that's varied very significantly. Um, secondly, you need to check the document and to actually look at it, which is actually probably quite um, straightforward um, sounding again, where you kind of look at the document and you uh, look it over. Um, but essentially, as we'll see uh, as we go on, you have to know what you're checking for. And my line on checking the documents is always that you have to be like a bouncer on a nightclub door. You have to look at the document and say, is this the person in front of me? Or is, is this the person's brother, sister, cousin, next, next door neighbour? Um, so you have to actually check and engage with the document. And depending on where in your organisation right to work checks are done, um, that can prove challenging. And then thirdly, you have to copy the document. And, and the one of the, the documents that is quite common to copy is a biometrics residence permit. It's a bit like a um, photo car driving licence and it's double sided. Um, on the front, it's got a photo. We'll have a picture of it as we go on. We see all sorts of variations of copying that. So sometimes it's just a pure photocopy. Sometimes half of the page is copied. Um, a lot of the time, just one side of it is, is, is copied and not the other side. And on the back, it has the date of birth and the nationality. So the back is actually quite important. So even those who know that you have to do these three steps can still go wrong at various um, stages in it. So in your processes, you should build in some sort of um, check, whether that be having us in to do audits of your right to work sessions uh, or your right to work practices um, or doing internal audits or having some sort of double check within the system where someone else is sampling the, the documents to make sure it's done properly. So that's a summary of the, of the changes and the, um, the, the system has not changed um, away from those three stages, but each of those three stages has become more complex depending on the nationality of the person that you're dealing with. And that's where the real complexity of right to work checks um, comes in now. So in terms of obtaining the documents, there are approved um, lists of what documents are acceptable. Um, many of you will already have those. If you're completely new to this, then um, get in touch and, and we can send you those um, lists of, of documents. Um, when you're obtaining the documents um, in person, um, under the rules that are currently in place, and there's been about three changes to the rules over the last 12 months, um, the only documents that you are physically obtaining now are for um, British and Irish nationals um, post-Brexit. So the Irish are treated the same as the British. So for British and Irish nationals, you can obtain their existing um, British or Irish uh, passport. For um, certain UK issued documents, so that would be maybe uh, a birth certificate, um, a naturalisation certificate, so naturalisation is where someone has become British, um, a, a passport that shows an indefinite leave to remain stamp in it, or vignette in it, or a, or a valid entry clearance vignette. So um, when you obtain the physical documents under the old rules, you would obtain everyone's physical documents. Now it's really narrowed into British and Irish nationals, and then some people with a, a visa, and then some ancillary documents like a, a birth certificate, a naturalisation certificate, or, or a marriage certificate, where there's been a name change. Um, when you check the documents, you should be checking that they are um, genuine. Now, the rules don't mean that you should be an expert in forged 
document. But you should be looking for obvious things like the, the kind of corner is hanging off or the document's been through a washing machine, that type of thing. Um, and just asking questions, getting a second opinion from a colleague, seeking professional advice if you're getting documents that, that look like they're not um, correct. And again, that bouncer point of checking that relates to the person in front of you, checking the expiry dates and checking any work um, restrictions. And, and one of the most common things um, that you'll need to check for is the name. And, and, and this is more common than one would think, that the name on the passport that you've been shown is often very different from the the name of the, the person that's applied for the job. And that could be someone using a maiden name or a married name following a marriage or divorce. Um, it could be a common misspelling of a name um, whereby someone um, has, I don't know, a double M instead of a single M in a name or, or a name where there's maybe three or four different spellings. Um, or it, it could be an issue where someone uses their um, middle name and not their Christian name in terms of um, what they're known by. So these are kind of things that you should check for in the documents and then ask for an explanation of and then seek further documents on if necessary. So, OK, you're divorced and you're using your maiden name again. Can we see the divorce decree um, as an additional document? So th there's that little bit of investigation that has to go on. Uh, there and you shouldn't be afraid to ask those those questions. Um, those questions can be awkward, and sometimes you have to do it sensitively. Sometimes it, it can relate to the photograph where you're looking at someone thinking this looks like a completely different uh, person, um, and it, it could be that you're looking at my passport um, and there's someone with I don't know a big bushy beard and long hair, and then the person in front of you has a has a skinhead and, and a clean shave, and then the explanation might simply be, well, I don't know, that was taken during lockdown when the barbers were shut, uh, or I shaved my hair off, or my photograph was taken in a, a more traditional country where I had to have a head covering and, and a beard, and now I've taken it off and I've come here. Um, and if in doubt about the way people look, you should always get a second opinion from someone else, whether it be in your team or elsewhere. Um, that sounds quite way out there, but it's actually not. It's actually really, really... Um, common. Um, it's a really common issue that, that comes up and you can be caught out quite easily because you bear in mind that the people who um, perhaps don't have the right to work in the UK um, will go through all sorts of tricks to try and, um, and convince you that they do. So unless you're on your guard, you can, be, you can be caught out, again, like the bouncer, letting in someone who's 17 or not, not 18 to a club. So when you copy and retain the documents, and this is still for British Irish nationals, um, then you should be making a clear copy. You can either hold it electronically or you, you can hold a physical copy. But the important thing is that the copies are accessible, that you're able to get them um, on demand, as it were, should the Home Office come up. And the it's not enough to simply copy it, you must. Um, uh, keep a note of the date that the document was checked. So some people will do that on the actual document, um, make a declaration on the document um, by putting the, the date and the name of the employee. Um, it's not sufficient to simply write the date. You have to, um, in terms of the guidance, write the date on which the right to work check was made and put the, put the date. Um, you have to then retain the document on uh, file and there are rules on how long you should retain it for, uh, usually for the duration of the um, employment and for, for two years afterwards. We get asked all sorts of complicated questions about GDPR in relation to retaining right to work checks, but as immigration specialists, our view is always that the immigration rules trump uh, whatever GDPR processes you have in uh, place, primarily because the consequences of not doing right to work checks and not retaining the documents um, can be really um, damaging for, for a business. Uh, this is what the, the biometric residence permit looks like. Um, and the biometric residence permit, the BRP, is what those who are not British or Irish um, or a pre-Brexit European will usually have. And, and you'll see on the, on the style here, um, 
it has an expiry date on it and it has uh, any restrictions down the bottom. So one of the most common restrictions is that people would not work um, more than 20 hours a week. And, and that's usually international students have that restriction or other restrictions will be that people will not work as a, a sports person or sports coach. So if you're in the sporting world, you have to be really cautious about uh, restrictions in relation to working as professional sports people. Um, if you're employing international students, you have to be doubly cautious about how you pay them, how you record that, and that's probably a separate uh, conversation. When it comes to biometric residence uh, permits, they are being phased out uh, from 2024 and, and they're all moving um, online. So um, at the moment, we shouldn't be um, using, uh, or the way we deal with BRPs is going to change quite um, significantly in terms of demonstrating right to work checks using biometrics residence permits. Um, because the full system is moving away from looking at physical documents onto online checks. Um, and um, from, from this year, from the 6th of April, you had to carry out, you have to, uh, you've had to, ha you've had to start carrying out online checks on anyone with a biometrics residence permit um, and Europeans. So uh, when Brexit happened, all the Europeans who were already in the UK um, had to register the status. They don't have a biometrics card. They don't have um, any paperwork um, to show that they have a visa, the right to stay here. Their status is all online. Um, and it's now the same for biometrics card holders that their status is an online status as well. So for British and Irish nationals, you can still do physical checks subject to what we're going to see further on. Uh, for Europeans after Brexit, you're doing an online status check. And for anyone who has an existing visa in the UK, a biometrics permit, you're also doing online checks. Now, the online checks are fairly straightforward. Um, and it's got the same three-step process to the online checks. And this is where um, most of the right to work checks will be going as we move forward, that you use the system. So you um, you do the check or you, you log into the system, you then do the check and then, then you retain proof that you've done the check. So when you use the system, um, you use it by getting a share code. So it's, it's the same concept that a car hire business would use with the DVLA where you want to hire a car, you go into the DVLA website and you create a share code, which you give to the car hire company and they check whether you've got any points on your license. So it's the same here where the individual will log into their portal and will create a share code, which they will give to you um, or will be emailed to you from the home office. And then you must log into the employer side of the um, website and do the right to work check there. It's really important that you don't just look at someone's laptop where they show you uh, their side, they must give you the share code and you must log in. Um, that's to prevent fraud, but secondly, that is also to, um, uh, to maintain a digital record that you have actually done the, the, the check. Um, and then you must retain a copy of that. So you, the system allows you to create a PDF um, or you can print out the page and you don't need to add any additional wording to it. The system says that they maintain a, a digital record of when the check was conducted, but I don't think we would trust that just yet. And therefore you should be uh, still printing out or retaining the, the proof that you've done the, the check and, and then again retaining again retaining that as you move forward. And, and this is what it um, this is what it, it looks like. Um, it's a online status here and you'll see on, on that slide that it confirms when the person has the right to work until and it confirms any um, any restrictions that they might have on their right to work on the portal. Um, for st students, mostly, you might still require additional information around them having the right to work other than just doing the status check. 
So students can tend, international students can tend to work uh, 20 hours a week. Some are restricted to even 10 hours a week. Um, but during term or out with term time, the students, the international students can uh, work full time, but employers need to confirm when term time actually is or confirm when people's courses have um, ended. And for those who employ international students, very rarely do we see employers um, um, having this information from the university. And that's another easy place for people to fall down in terms of right to work checks. Last year during COVID, we had um, what were called adjusted right to work checks, where people could simply scan documents to you or hold them up on camera on Zoom or um, or Teams calls. Um, there was then all sorts of changes to that process. Um, all you probably need to know now is that you can't do that anymore. So you cannot do... Um, checks of documents over Teams or over um, Zoom. And you either have to do them online or in person. So the, the COVID adjusted checks, which I think we all got used to pretty quickly, are now uh, gone and, and gone completely and probably not coming back. Um, lots of clients will say to us, well, we simply can't do face-to-face -face checks because X, Y, and Z. And the answer from the Home Office is simply, well, you had to do face-to-face -face checks forever. And it's only in the last two years that you've been doing um, online checks and therefore, or you've, you've been doing Zoom checks and therefore you have to default back um, to doing face-to-face um, -face checks or online checks. The one um, change to that is in relation to um, British and Irish uh, nationals where you can essentially outsource your uh, checks to uh, a third party. Um, and Vincent's going to talk about how this is done. So the summary, I suppose, of where we are now is that there are maybe three sets of people. Uh, there are British and Irish nationals who you can either do the outsourcing for, which is what we're going to talk about now, um, which is the biggest change, or you do them in person. There's then the Europeans and anyone with a biometrics permit, so anyone with a visa, at, at which point you have to do the online checks using the, um, the, 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 the status share code that the employee gives you. And then the documents that you're seeing in person are only for uh, those who are already in the UK and might need additional uh, documentation. So I'll pass over to Vincent, who's going to speak about um, the IDVT um, technology that businesses like Amicus are offering the outsourcing of, of checks. I see we've got a lot of questions and I've not been able to see them as we go, but we'll maybe come back to those once Vincent's uh, finished speaking. Thanks, Jamie. Yeah, that was all really interesting. It's like always a good, uh, for me, a good reminder um, as to what the existing uh, right to work checks are. Um, for the next couple of slides, um, I am going to uh, apologise in advance. There are quite a lot of acronyms. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, I've tried to uh, explain what they are on, on each slide so you know what, what I'm talking about. So, um, in terms of the um, IDVT, which is Identity uh, Document Verification Technology process, um, that came into play uh, from the 6th of April 2022. Um, but I, I suspect that many uh, businesses didn't actually start using that process uh, because the uh, adjusted COVID right to work checks were still in place. And um, with, you know, over the last uh, six months or so, um, there have been more and more providers um, who have signed up and have been um, certified um, against these certain standards. So um, there's the UK Digital Identity and Attributes Trust Framework, uh, as well as the GPG 4.5. Um, and those are um, uh, sort of minimum benchmarks that the government um, 
recommend and advise that uh, third party providers uh, meet. And in terms of uh, the IDVT uh, process, at the moment, um, there's currently uh, 17 uh, certified providers, and there is a list of that. Um, and it is recommended that these um, providers meet the minimum um, level of confidence at a medium level. You can go, you know, you can sign up and, you know, work with um, a, a, a provider who is at a low level, but you're then sort of potentially exposing yourself um, to, to potential downfalls of, of their processes and their systems. So the Home Office, the government, do recommend that you go in at a minimum of a medium level of confidence. Um, the IDVT process is a sort of good additional option um, for British and uh, British and Irish uh, citizens if they hold a valid uh, passport or um, identity card, and um, it has to be a valid document. So where the um, British passport or, or, or Irish passport card is no longer valid. You can't use this IDVT process, so you then have to revert back um, to uh, a, a manual check um, of the original document. And uh, for the providers, uh, they will charge um, a fee, and that will range uh, depending on what services you need so if you just need a basic uh, right to work check then you know it should be at the, the relatively lower um, scale um, but if you need to do a uh, criminal record checks um, and, and such like then they might charge you a bit more and uh, on the slide I've said that um, you know it's a commercial balance between cost and convenience um, and using the IDVT process, um, this is the only method in which you can establish a statutory excuse through a third party check. Um, so where you're using the um, manual check or you're doing the share code online check, that has to be carried out in-house, uh, whether it's by um, you know, your HR department or another employee, a manager, but it has to be done in-house. So you know, we as lawyers can conduct a check for you uh, manually or using the share code, but we cannot help you establish a statutory excuse that way. You can only establish that statutory excuse yourself if you do it in-house. And um, another sort of benefit for the um, IDVT um, is that um, many um, employers are still working on a sort of hybrid remote working. So it gives them that extra um, option, that flexibility um, to, to carry out these checks and uh, ensure that the prospective employee does indeed have that right to work and you're doing this and you're getting um, the checks completed prior to employment um, commencing. And so, you know, with remote working, that is um, quite a benefit. And uh, we do know that um, quite a few um quite a few um, businesses have already signed up with uh, providers um, to, to uh, conduct these checks um, on their behalf. And I would just flag up that whilst the um, IDBT process um, is an extra option, um, do remember that some um, prospective British Irish uh, citizen employees might not have um, valid documents anymore. Um, so you can't insist that they go through the IDVT process. It's just an extra um, option for you. So you might have to rely on a manual check on an expired um, British or Irish um, doc, uh, passport or passport card, which is fine. Um, but it's just to flag up that the IDVT, in theory, is a really good option, but you, you can't insist on um, going through this process because not all employees um, will have valid documents. So in terms of the process itself, um, it's the, the provider um, who the document, the, the, a, a digital copy of the documents is provided to, and the provider um, is expected to take all reasonable steps to check the validity of the documents and verify um, that the 
um, person presenting the documents um, is the same person um, on the photo um, of, of the document. And when the provider carries out their check, um, there will be mandatory information which they must provide to you as the employer, and they need to provide this in a format which can't be altered. So whether this is um, a PDF that they send you uh, by email that you can access by an online link, or whether they you know, send it to you by post, you know, it has to be in a format which can't be altered. And every, um, you know, different providers will have uh, different ways in which they provide you um, that information. And the information that they need to uh, provide you, that they must provide you, it's mandatory, is their full name. And that includes their middle name if they have one. Um, they need to provide you their date of birth and um, a copy of the biometric page of the document with their photos. Um, they need to confirm whether um, the identity has been verified of the person presenting the document. Um, they need to confirm who checked the document. And uh, most importantly, um, and as a standard um, across all right to work checks, is when the date um, of the ID check was conducted. Um, and it's uh, really important um, that. Uh, they provide you with this mandatory information to help you uh, so that you can establish uh, your statutory excuse. And um, from the employer side, um, for what you need to look out for is um, you need to use um, a, a third party provider who can uh, conduct these um, checks for you. And um, as I said uh, at the beginning is um, we should be using um, or it's recommended that you use a certified provider and at a medium level of confidence. It's less risky that way um, for you um, you're uh, less exposed if you go through that, that option. Um, and you need to carry out your own due diligence um, to make sure that you've got a reasonable belief that the provider has completed the checks correctly against their guidance. And um, so if they're a certified provider, you can probably assume a reasonable level of confidence, a medium level of confidence, um, but you might just still um, ask around, you know, you might do um, shop around as it were and sort of just ask, um, you know, whether they are adhering to the latest um, right to work guidance um, and, and relevant guidance to maintain that level of confidence. Um, and uh, again, once you've got um, the, the mandatory information from the provider, you still need to just check that um, the photo and the personal details are consistent. So just because the provider has um, carried out the checks, um, you still need to sort of when the prospective employee um, comes to work on, on day one or whatnot, you still need to check that the photo is still consistent and the names are still consistent. And um, if it is, uh, you know, if there has been a name change, um, then as uh, with the manual or the online share code check, you still need to make inquiries and retain evidence just to marry up all of that information so that if the Home Office were to turn up, you can reasonably explain with evidence um, where, uh, you know, why there's a slight uh, difference in, um, in, in, in their name. And it's important that you um, retain that information uh, securely, either electronically or in a hard copy format, and that you maintain a clear copy. So if it's slightly blurry, for instance, you leave yourself exposed to the Home Office saying, well, actually, this is not a clear copy. Um, we can't be confident that, that, you know, that this is all compliant. Therefore, you don't establish your statutory excuse. Uh, so if it's slightly blurry, blurry um, I would go back to the provider and ask for um, a clearer um, copy. Um, And then in terms of um, failure to, to carry out right to work checks, um, it, it remains an offence to knowingly employ a person who is not lawfully um, in the UK. And if you don't carry out a right to work check itself, that is fine, but you don't establish um, a statutory excuse. So um, if it transpires that someone that you're employing um, is an illegal worker, 
and you've not carried out a right to work check in the prescribed manner and you've not retained compliant evidence, you don't have that statutory excuse. So you could be liable um, potentially for um, a civil penalty um, for uh, up to £20,000 per illegal worker. Um, there's uh, in, in the more serious cases, uh, you could be subject to criminal sanctions um, up to uh, um, a jail sentence of up to five years uh, and an unlimited um, fine. Uh, there can also be um, other um, implications such as um, the, the, the uh, premises being uh, temporarily closed, the, the government naming and shaming, so reputational damage. Um, if you're a, a licensed um, sponsor, you can sponsor migrants, um, then you're probably, well, I would say that you are subject to a higher degree of scrutiny because one of your duties, one of your obligations is that you carry out right to work checks. And as a licensed sponsor, you're already on the radar um, of, of the Home Office by virtue of being a licensed sponsor. So the best protection um, for you as, as an employer um, is to carry out right to work checks on all new um, employees, prospective employees, before um, employment commences. And that doubles up as a protection against discrimination claims. If you're only choosing um, to carry out right to work checks based on the way someone looks, uh, based on their perceived nationality, uh, you know, you're exposing yourself to discrimination claims. And therefore, if you just carry out right to work checks on everyone, um, then you're you're um, minimizing your your risks and your exposures um, to uh, discrimination claims. Vincent, then, I think um, I think we've only got one or two more slides on yeah. just follow up right to work checks. I think we might skip those and just jump to the jump to the questions. Um, yeah. Because nice. I think there's so many questions, and, and I think the only other thing that we were going to cover um, that we haven't um, covered is the need to do follow-up checks. So it's not enough to do a check on day one of uh, employment. You also have to do follow-up checks if the person's on a temporary uh, visa of some sort. So I think we've got lots and lots of questions, um, which is probably a good thing. It means that people are... Uh, listening, or alternatively, it means that we haven't been uh, clear enough. But the the questions are there's there's so many questions. We're probably going to struggle to get to uh, all of the questions. I think um, some of them will be um, duplicate questions. Um, you can, of course, um, the send us any questions directly. But we'll maybe just fire through the through the list. Um, and just give quick answers to any of them. Vincent, there's questions about agency workers you can maybe cover off um, for us. Um, and I'll just run through the list quickly. Um, Chupi, right to work checks on Chupi. Um, there's a slight variation on Chupi, whether you, depending on whether you have a, a sponsor license or not. Usually when, if you're receiving workers post uh, Chupi, then um, you should be doing your own checks, um, I think within, is it 20 days, Vincent? Um, can I remember if it's 20 days? Uh, you get a 60 day grace period um, post days. Chupi um, to, um, so with, with, with Chupi, um, you can rely purely on the checks that have been conducted by the, the previous um, entity. Um, and therefore, if those uh, right to work checks were compliant, you inherit um, the, the statutory excuse. But if they were defective, you inherit that liability um, for that potential um, uh, civil penalty. So it's always our advice that um, you carry out right to work checks um, as soon as possible uh, post transfer. And you've got a 60 day grace period. And therefore, if you identify someone within that 60 day grace period um, that uh, they don't have a right to work um, and you've taken steps to address that, then the Home Office won't 
fine you uh, for that if there was an, an illegal worker. Um, so we would always advise that um, post troopy transfer that you always carry out fresh right to work checks um, on all those uh, transferred employees within that 60 day um, grace period and it's 60 calendar days. And, and I think in terms of that, if, if you have indemnities or warranties, bear in mind that they might cover you financially, but they don't cover the reputational issues or the loss of a sponsor license or any of the other implications of you not having redone the checks within the, within the grace period. Um, next question was, um, once you do a entry clearance vignette, you need to do the check again once they have the BRP. Um, yes, you should do the check again when they have the BRP. Um, bear in mind that on the face of it, the BRP will only be valid until December 2024. Um, but you should be doing the, the check again um, on that, but you can use the entry clearance vignette to get someone started, as it were, and they're going to have to go to the post office and pick up their um, BRP, at which point with a BRP now, you would use the online system. Are out-of-date passports still valid for right to work? It depends, I suppose, is the quick answer. I think Vincent covered that off there, that you cannot use the IDVT outsourced um, process with an out-to-date passport, so you'd have to do a manual check on an out-to-date British-Irish um, passport, and bear in mind it's kind of a risk-based approach as well. Um, work restrictions, would this relate to share codes being into the details? Of, the work restrictions should show up on the online system and the most common restriction being students and um, 20 hours. Uh, what about agency workers, self-employed workers, subcontractors who go directly to site? Is the employer responsible for checking all the originals or do they need share codes? Um, we'll maybe come back to agency workers because I think there's another question on that later on. We'll come to that at the end. Um, that can be quite complicated. Um, around how that's actually done um, and there'll be a combination of face-to-face -face checks um, or um, share codes but the question is well who's responsible for uh, doing that and that will depend on the circumstances. Remote business hire from across the UK using a provider for a valid British and Irish passport and we can check the share codes okay that's all fine but don't have the ability to be meeting face-to-face -face if the candidate cannot provide an in-date passport. Um, can we reject candidates if they cannot provide a valid British or Irish passport? What can we do with this? I think you have to be careful there because you cannot insist that a British or Irish worker uses the um, online system. So you have to find some mechanism where people do a face-to-face -face session because the, the ID checks that are not done, or right to work checks that are not done face to face is a new thing, essentially. Um, so it's not going to be a case of the government, the government simply won't adapt to post the post COVID world. Uh, they simply expect your business practices to change to suit the, the rule. So I don't think you can um, refuse a role to someone um, because they've got an out of date British passport and can't do the IDVT uh, checks. I think that'd be high risk. Um, if upon starting a new role, the files aren't on file, um, what's the best way to, to do it? This can be complicated. And this is where we see discrimination coming in because sometimes employers will target some employees with a foreign name or an accent and ask for their documents. Um, but EU nationals who had to register for settled or pre-settled status and it's not in file, is, the, is it retrospective? No, it's not, and that's going to cause problems moving forward, I suspect. Um, you don't have to ask EU nationals who were working with you um, prior to the transition ending um, to prove that they have settled or pre-settled status, um, and they are probably the same as employees who started working for you before 2008. So in theory, you could have someone working for you with no paperwork who is either a European here pre-Brexit who didn't register or someone who started working for you before 2008. Um, but I don't think the sanctions would kick in for them because you're not obliged to have done retrospective checks on 
any of them. And the EU nationals, I think, just causes confusion in that regard, but that was the approach the government took. I don't think it's the right approach, but, um, but it's the one that was taken. Um, if there's no right to work checks on any employees and you're asking for them to be done, then you should be asking everyone who started working after 2008 to do it. But you have to deal with that really, really delicately because that causes all sorts of um, all sorts of problems. Um, taking someone on a temp contract who's a, got a 20 hours max in term time. Um, so the 20 hours max issue is during term time. So it doesn't cover the holidays, so summer, Christmas, Easter. Um, and when they finish their course, usually courses finish, I don't know, around June, July, August, the visas would tend to run to January. So during the time between finishing their course and the visa ending, then yes, they can work um, full time as long as you've got written confirmation from the university. So that's correct. Um, is the share code only for European residents or worldwide? It's now worldwide, so it's now people with a biometrics card and Europeans. The only people who aren't subject to the share codes are um, British and Irish nationals. Um, can we check, check the share code profile page against the against the individual against the individual online? Does it have to be in person? I think the guidance says that you should be doing that in person uh, with people once you've got the share code. So essentially, the system's not as advanced as it, as it could be. Um, if they've got a BRP and a P45 from a previous employer, is there sufficient evidence of right to work? No, it's not, um, because the um, well, it depends what the BRP actually is. So you don't need a P45 to prove right to work. And likewise, you don't need um, a national insurance number to prove right to work. Um, if you've got a BRP that allows them the right to work for you, um, then that's sufficient. And bear in mind that a BRP might allow them to work for another employer, not you. Um, I would just add uh, for that one, um, if it's a new employee, um, you would use the online check, uh, the online share code check, because it's after uh, 6th of April 2022. So just because they might have um, been able to work for another employer uh, and rely on their currently still valid BRP, that was probably before 6th of April. So if any, if you conduct a, a right to work check on anyone who's presenting you with a BRP on or after 6th of April 2022, you have to use the online uh, share code check method. Vincent, I'm, I'm going to answer another couple and pass over to you because I'm sure. running out of breath, trying to answer <laughs> questions quick, quick fire. Um, can you rely on share codes completed by other employers, agencies in the Chupi scenario? Yes, you can, but bear in mind what we said about Chupi earlier that you inherit the problems if they've not done them um, properly. Um, done with individual present, yes, it should be. Um, how do you verify right to work for someone on a four-week FTC in a remote based? Um, the same way as you would for a permanent worker that the remote working like I say, the immigration system not quite caught up with that. So technically speaking, you would have to do it in um, person unless they're British or Irish and you're using the IDBT um, system. Yes, we'll share the slides. Uh, yes, anyone in the business can do a right to work check. It doesn't have to be the HR team. Um, agency workers, Vincent, do you want to cover off agency workers? So. Just very quickly, agency workers is quite complex and um, the, it's not as simple as it is maybe in employment law um, terms, but it's very clearly defined who's who. Uh, when it comes to immigration, there's an issue, the same with visas as well and visa sponsorship. There's an issue about control. Um, Vincent, do you want to touch on that? Yeah. Um as Jamie's already flagged up, agency workers is always a bit of a, a, a tricky one. So um, if they were um, a direct employee, then absolutely you would. But if it's an agency worker where it's supplied um, by, by a, an agency, um, I think you would sort of take a, a pragmatic view um, because if they if the Home Office were to conduct a right to work check and they didn't have the right to work, 
um, and they were found on your premises, um, it's not going to be so streamlined that they can absolutely say, oh, they're not your employee. They would still need to go through their processes, their checks, uh, potentially issue a, a penalty before you can then contest that. So I would say that it's always at least good practice to obtain information and obtain sight of what their right to work status is in the UK. Um, so that you can then have a level of um, assurance. And it may be that, you know, uh, if you're getting um, agency workers, you might have an agreement in place where um, they, you know, the, the agent um, provides a, a sort of guarantee within their contract um, or, or whatnot that, you know, they have conducted uh, compliant right to work checks. Um, but ultimately, I think you would still want to know and have sight of their right to work status. Um, but because of the, the potential uh, implications. Yeah, I, th I think the Home Office will find someone pretty quickly and do find people pretty quickly. And then you're on the back foot in the Sheriff Court, if you're in Scotland, trying to explain why under employment law you're not the employer, but, but you're the one sitting with the fine, basically what we see. Um, yes, we'll provide, so we're running out of time, but yes, we'll provide a list of the certified providers for IDVT, you need to watch to make sure that your provider remains on, on the list, uh, on the approved list. Um, can a person send a passport and then perform the check via video call? Uh, not anymore, no. Um, what happens if we check the share code and it confirms the immigration status but doesn't mention anything about the right to work? Um, you can always check with us because the, the immigration status should make it clear that they have the right to work in the UK. How do you attain an international student's term date? You can either contact the university directly or you can uh, print out the dates from their uh, website, I think is also acceptable. Um, we take copies of the passport, we stamp a stand copy with a certified copy of original, sign it, hold that electronically, is that sufficient? Um, no, I think you have to be clear that that's a, it's not just a certified copy of the original, but it's the date that the right to work check has been uh, carried out. You don't have to write it manually, you could stamp it or or hold a spreadsheet of, of the date separately. Um, I, I would just add that um, it's not required, but it might be good practice for that person carrying out the right to work to put their name and, and sign against that check as well. So then there can be no dispute that it was an employee of that organisation and not a third party um, who conducted that right to work check. So that's just a sort of extra step above and beyond what is required within the guidance. Yeah, to, to the extent that certified copy could be a solicitor certifying the copy. Um, why would you use this if they have a valid passport for UK and Irish citizens? Why would you use IDVT? Sometimes it's easier if you're a bigger business just to um, outsource the checks and other times it'll be done alongside criminal record checks or other stuff. Yeah. Passports need to be in date. We've covered that. No, you don't have to use IDVT. Um, I would require to ask proof of NI and address. No, you're not. Does a manual check have to be face to face? Um, yes, it does. Can checks be taken in person? Um, if, if you've got offshore workers, um, if they're British or Irish, you can use the IDVT one. Um, if they're not British or Irish, then you're going to have to get them to come into their base before they go off shore or get some sort of system in place for that. Can you do it over teams? I don't think so. Um, how do you manage it on day one if the remote worker? Um, what's that? How do you manage to check on IDVT on day one? IDVT is outsourced, essentially. Um, so we're moving away from video Zoom checks. Um, I think we're about to, we're maybe out of time, but um, I think a lot of the questions are um, um, are similar. There's one about um, transgender, but the, but the candidate that was in transition. Um, that's quite a complicated one. It's a sensitive one as well. Um, you would want to be satisfied um, that that is indeed the, the position um and have some sort of evidence of that whether that be a official uh proof or if it's, if they're not at that stage um yet then you'd want some other secondary view on it either from us um 
to protect yourself, you'd want some sort of um, documentation on uh, file. We can pick up that one maybe separately if we be. Uh, I think we've run out of time. Unless you carry out right to work checks for the candidates, that's employment. Yes, you must. Um, and what if you're the agency based in Scotland sending people to work in England? Uh, the rules are UK um, are UK wide, um, so it's the same. And then final question, we're not going to take any more. What's the point of doing IBT if you can't do the verification online? The I, IDBT, you can do, you're outsourcing it and doing it all online. Um, and you're not doing, IDBT is only for British and Irish nationals. The one that you can't do online is the share codes for Europeans or those visa holders who are not British or Irish. So we're now, I'm afraid, out of time. Um, we had a lot of questions there to get through. It probably shows the complexity of this area and the complexity of the rule changes. Um, hopefully we've answered the questions. Sorry we had to do it so uh, quickly. We couldn't give us detailed answers to all of the questions. I think we got to almost all of them. Uh, thanks for joining the session. Vincent and I and the rest of the team are here for you. If you need any help, just um, pick up with us. Um, we're more than happy to assist on right to work checks or anything else relating to visas. So we'll let you go. Thanks for joining us and hope you have a great week. Thanks everyone.